Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Dariush Mozafarian of Tufts University and former USDA Secretary Dan Glickman, launching a major initiative to address poor nutrition's role in the burden of disease in the U.S. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. On September 28th, the Biden-Harris administration will host the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And our guests are well familiar with the scope of the problem and how the levers of public policy can be leveraged to make a real difference in the lives of millions of Americans. Dan Glickman is the former Secretary of Agriculture and a former House member. He's the co-chair of an initiative focused on informing this White House conference. Dr. Dariush Muzaffarian is with Tufts University, and he's a renowned expert on food systems and is also serving as co-chair of this very special effort. Well, welcome to both of you to Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Glickman, let, let's start out with you. It's, it's important that we note your effort is officially independent from the White House, but you can give us a preview, if you will. Uh, we know the administration will release a national strategy with actions the federal government will take to drive solutions, and they're looking to end U.S. hunger and reducing diet-related diseases in a majority of Americans by 2030. How, how will all of this play out, and what more can we expect to see? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And you have a real expert on this, who's Dari Masafarian, who was the dean at, at Tufts and still is, is very much involved at Tufts and elsewhere. And it's important to, to know the historical context of this, because in 1969, Tufts led the effort to create a national uh, uh, discussion about food, nutrition, and health at the first White House conference convened by then-President Nixon. And as a result of that conference, we basically created almost all the feeding programs that exist today, it either created them or expanded them or included them in, in, a, in a national effort. And that would be food stamps, which became SNAP, it would be the WIC program in women yep. and for children. It would be a lot of our anti-hunger programs, school meals. And so it was seminal and transformational. And so we've done a lot since then. Many recommendations, uh, including those programs, were enacted as a result of that conference. And we thought after 50 years, it would be appropriate to have a new conference to look and see where our federal feeding programs are, how we're dealing with nutrition and health in American society, and the role of science in all of this. So Tufts has led this effort, and we had a kind of eclectic group of people working together to see if we could come up with a series of recommendations would, uh, and policy proposals, which would go to the White House and hopefully form the basis for their recommendations that they're going to make in, in when the conference is held on September 28th. So it, this is really is something that's seminal and transformational, and we hope that the White House takes with it and takes it and runs with it. Well, we are very excited about it. But Dr. Uh, Mosafari, and I want to maybe turn to you for a moment uh, and, and note that we know food inflation is high and Feeding America says one in eight people face hunger. But We've just seen this new analysis that found that child poverty dropped by 59% from 1993 to 2019, uh, and an increased safety net that's developed over those years that is getting a lot of the praise for that. So from your perspective, how severe is the problem and are things improving? Are they moving in the right direction? Well, I think what's happened is we've learned the problems are more complicated. And you know, in 1969, the, the problems that were at the top of the agenda were really families, kids not getting enough calories. There were there were videos, there were there were national documentaries done, uh, hearings that were done going around the country, where you would see families, you'd see children with you know emaciated arms and distended bellies, like you might see now in some of the poorest parts of the world. So really, the focus in 1969 was about getting calories to people, and it was successful. And, and we have to remember that there have been some successes of 1969 and our modern food system in greatly reducing, you know, frank kind of starvation, not only in the United States, but around the world, greatly reducing vitamin deficiencies. We, you know, diseases like pellagra and rickets and night blindness from vitamin A deficiency and these other conditions were really common in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s. And so, so we have addressed those. But what we have now, it's kind of a, a, a mess of a situation where more Americans are sick than are healthy from diet-related diseases like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. And at the same time, 
we have people who are food insecure. So maybe on average over the course of a whole year, they're getting enough calories, but on any given day and any given week and any given meal, they may be uncertain where their food comes from. It's challenging and they're not able to get the quality of the food that they want. And so this has also led the USDA and Secretary Vilsack to focus on nutrition security, not just hunger, but nutrition security. And so I think what we've learned and why we need the second conference is that some things are better, you know, sort of frank lack of calories and lack of vitamins is, is, is mostly gone, but families are struggling, people are struggling, and not just low-income Americans. Every segment of society, every state, uh, every family practically knows somebody who's suffering from a diet-related disease. You know, Mr. Secretary, let's dig into your group's recommendation. One of the more interesting that caught our eye is accelerate access to food is medicine services to prevent and treat diet-related illnesses. You know, I think back to our own movement in 1965, a young physician, Dr. Jack Geiger, who would form the Community Health Center moment in the Mississippi Delta, is prescribing food uh, just to those uh, types of patients that uh, Dr. Mosafarian was just talking about, uh, sending, uh, sending the bill to their pharmacy. Uh, I guess, uh, why is this not happening right now? Would, would, and tell me uh, how community health centers might uh, play a role uh, in the solutions. Well, first of all, I am not a physician. I'm not a doctor. I'm a jurist doctor, which is, entitles me to pontificate on everything, <laughs> but no, not so much about everything as well. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the old French philosopher who said you are what you eat, I can't think, I, I can't actually pronounce his name, but it is the, the whole issue of food being an integral part of your medical care, of your mortality, of your uh, uh, likelihood of getting a disease is something that we know more about today, and it's much higher profile than it was before, not only in terms of extending human life and making it so you live better during the time you are alive, but also the enormous cost to our healthcare system of diet-related diseases, so whether it's diabetes or, or other chronic type diseases. And so I think the conference, largely through Dari's involvement and Tufts' help and others in the medical profession, are trying to actually tie the knot between health and medicine and nutrition. And, you know, to some extent, the medical community over the last 50 years has not given a lot of attention to that. I know when I have my the annual physical exam, I have to ask the doctor about nutrition and eating. And I mean, he's looking at my blood sugar and maybe saying, you got to get it down, but he's not giving me a comprehensive or she is not giving me a comprehensive a set of guidelines and what to follow. And so that lack of information is not helpful to the customer and the consumer, the patient, nor is it necessarily reflective of an understanding of these issues by the medical profession itself. So as Dari said, this is a really comprehensive problem. It means you involve, got to involve new actors. So who are those new actors? One is community health systems because they are where the rubber hits the road with so many people, particularly lower income people. You got to figure out how we educate our medical professionals, not just doctors, but nurses, nutritionists, dietitians, and everybody else into the, this part of medicine. It's not just treating people when they lie horizontal. It's treating people when they're walking down the street so they could live better lives. And so, so those all fit into what we're trying to do as part of this conference. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, another uh, recommendation uh, seems to shine maybe a bit of a spotlight on uh, what we'll call the junk food uh, makers and producers. And you've indicated that you want to reduce the marketing of foods that do not align with the official dietary guidelines for Americans and maybe increase the marketing of food that does align uh, with these guidelines. And of course, we would assume we can anticipate some pushback. So what are you thinking in terms of the pushback that you're going to get and what's your response going to be? Well, I, I would just point you in one direction. One of the things we're looking at is the SNAP program and what people are eating on the SNAP program and whether there's an excessive consumption of, of uh, sugar-sweetened beverages and and other foods that maybe don't meet the dietary guidelines of USDA or or similar guidelines that are out there. This is, you know, this is a controversial item because uh, it pits the food companies and make many of them make a lot of money on on packaged foods that are highly uh, sugared up and salted up and other kinds of things. And um, it also splits some of the in, in the hunger community who don't want to see the poor treated different than the rich, so to speak, in terms of what they can buy. And these are policy issues that we have talked about in our report. 
But one thing I think that is important is particularly with kids, um, television and social media and the media has a lot to do with what people eat. And, you know, we were addicted to our smartphones and, uh, and, and, and somewhat addicted to television as well. And we know that we don't advertise strawberries or blueberries or, or sweet potatoes on uh, television. We advertise a lot of uh, highly caloried up uh, foods because they're tasty and because they can be eaten quickly and conveniently. So we, we have within the guidelines of the First Amendment, we can't really engage in censorship per se, but you know, the Federal Trade Commission and other government agencies can be involved in what's shown to children, and they have done some steps in that regard as well. And Dari would know a lot more about this because they've done a lot more research at Tufts than almost any place else in the world, how these outside influences, coupled with the different way that families eat, you have two income families that are working, it's cooking is not necessarily as high a priority as it once was. You know, all these cultural factors enter the play as well. Oh. Uh, M- Margaret, can I can I jump in there with a, a, a comment as well? So, so I think first one of the important things about our task force report is that it's really the, the main multi sector consensus report. We not only had experts, but we had experts from lots of different disciplines. We had a strategy group of national organizations. We did three national convenings uh, in addition, bringing to people together from around the country, and we also held sixteen listening sessions with people. Uh, particularly from low-income backgrounds who had lived experience in hunger and for nutrition health. And in our task force, we include representatives from the food industry. Uh, uh, Leslie Saracen is the head of FMI, which is actually the largest organization of retailers and food manufacturers in the country. We include people from insurance, uh, Brooks Tingle, the CEO of John Hancock Insurance. And we include people from healthcare, Pam Schwartz, who leads kind of the food efforts at Kaiser Permanente. So we really, this is a multi-sector report and that recommendation you mentioned had the consensus of the whole committee. It doesn't mean that any one person said, oh yeah, this is my favorite part or any one person endorsed it. But as a whole, the whole task force agreed that that was important. So there's more consensus than you might think that even for food companies, if they can be rewarded for advertising healthier foods, right? You know, that would be a good thing. And maybe they'd accept a little bit of a carrot and a stick approach. Uh, Dan is right that to restrict marketing has some limitations around the right to free speech in the United States. Maybe that could be done for marketing to young kids because there's evidence that kids up to age five don't really understand an ad as an ad. So that could be considered deceptive. So maybe legally there could be some restrictions. But I think there's, this is a time where the food industry recognizes that business as usual is not going to work. The consumer, especially the young American consumer, is demanding healthier, more authentic food that's sustainably grown, that has uh, uh, just social labor. And, and they're, they're not buying the old products. These legacy products are dying. And so, and so I think it's a moment for the government to help to work with uh, industry and carrots and sticks to, to move it forward. And then the other uh, comment I wanted to make is thinking about advertising. My uh, 11-year-old daughter noticed this. We were watching you know, the Super Bowl or, or you know, one of these, 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 these football games. And she noticed that advertisements that were for food companies had the worst possible food you can imagine. All, all kinds of fast food and junk food. And just we would just groan and moan at the screen how, how gross it all looked, uh, actually. And then advertisements that had food in them but were for other things, for aspirational things, had terrific food. Things that were for credit cards or cars or going out with your family, you know, for, for a night out. Advertisements for anything else beyond food that had food in the ad showed these wonderful cheese plates and grapes and fruits and incredible dinners. So Americans know what actually is kind of the aspirational food that we all want to eat. And marketers know how to use it, but they're not using it to sell food. They're using it to sell other things, which is really ironic. Dr. Musafari, and I want to maybe take a, a sort of bigger look at the issue in front of us. One of the recommendations calls for increasing access to participation in the federal nutrition programs, expanding eligibility, simplifying enrollment, improving convenience for participants. But there's a school of thought out there that this is just tinkering around the edges. As long as we have systemic inequity and in the current economic policy, we will never really be able to tackle hunger. What do you say about that argument? 
Well, I, so I think first, you know, the federal nutrition programs are, you know, the strongest and most important programs to address hunger and food insecurity in the country. And so, you know, SNAP covers on average, depends, varies from year to year, but about, you know, 10% of, uh, or 11% of American families are on SNAP. WIC, the program for, for mothers and young babies, one in two babies born in the United States are on WIC. There's also uh, programs like, uh, uh, you know, uh, meals for the elderly and, of course, school meals. You know, 60%, 65% of kids regularly consume school meals. So these are really, really important programs. I think the challenge is showing that the dollars that we're putting into those programs are bringing a return on investment so that in, a, in an era of declining, you know, b- budgets, um, that we can make the, the argument. If we just use the moral argument to expand these programs, some folks, kind of folks on the more progressive side of the political spectrum will be all for it, but others, moderates and more cons- fiscally conservative folks will say, yeah, we can't afford this. It's a good idea. So I think to bring everybody on board first, we have to show that this brings a return on investment by showing that when kids get healthier school meals or when mothers get WIC or when people are on SNAP and actually are encouraged and incentivized to, to eat healthier, that it lowers healthcare spending, that it makes them more productive, that it improves the competitiveness of the American economy. We, we are spending more on healthcare than on these programs by far, right? Healthcare has risen from about 5% of the federal budget in 1970, when we had the last conference, to now almost 30% of the federal budget. It's gone up sixfold in just these 50 years and it's squeezing out every other priority. So if we can spend less on healthcare, and more on, on di- which is 80% goes to chronic diseases, many of which are diet related. And then we can spend more on, on these programs. And you mentioned Jack Iger, um, you know, Jean Mayer, from, who, who became the president of Tufts, organized the White House conference. Jack Geiger is from Tufts Medical right. School. So another Tufts alum, right? He understood that, that food is medicine. And so I think beyond expanding, if, if the whole White House conference is about the federal nutrition programs, I think it'll be a little bit of a disappointment to me because that's those are important, but we, we could have just done the farm bill. Well, you've we been an advocate that. of the hand and glove yeah. relationship between economic policy and science, right? That they go hand in hand and putting that, yeah. the, that data together uh, is, is yeah, I, 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 Oh, sorry. I, no, go no, ahead, no, but, Well, I was just going to say, I, I do think that poverty and income inequality is certainly a major factor. There, there's no doubt that lower income people have much greater challenges for food, energy, housing, all those things are really critical. But I wouldn't put it all on that side of the picture because we have too many evidences of lived experiences of poor people that want to eat better and know the difference between, you know, a heavily fat saturated hamburger, let's say, and fruits and vegetables and other things. I mean, it's, it, there's, uh, there, I think there are some people that make, make it seem like poor people are ignorant. And that's just not true at all. Uh, they have there's certainly economic disincentives for them to be able to purchase, in many cases, fresh produce in the same capacity as for particularly the higher income people. But I think this is just a comprehensive problem. It is partially poverty and in- income inequality. It's you know it's partially advertising and marketing. It's partially that the medical profession, frankly, has never really stepped up to the plate over the last fifty or sixty years. It's beginning to do so now. It, you know, it, it, it's it's partially national leadership, lack of coordination from a federal perspective. Um, and but positive news is is that is, is, is you know Dari talked about some of this, but the private sector is now much more engaged than they ever were because their productivity, their employees, is basically dependent on not getting sick. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, this this is why this is good that this has been elevated to an important national issue. Yeah, and and and, and I would add, Mark. So so to to, to you know um, kind of really get to the heart of your question. Um, if this is, we have a whole se- section on recommendations around the federal nutrition programs. They're incredibly important. I don't want to diminish their importance. And at the same time, we need big new ideas. And so I think the four big new ideas in our report that I really, really hope will be in the national strategy. And frankly, if they're not in the national strategy, we're still going to push them and try to make them happen. The, the four big new ideas are food is medicine. Let's integrate food and nutrition into healthcare. So you can go to your doctor and your doctor can write a prescription for a drug can t- send you to surgery or write a prescription for healthy food, right? That, that's possible for all Americans. Number two, science. We have to push forward the science and really 
accelerate our understanding of the gut microbiome and personalized nutrition and supplements and intermittent fasting and keto versus paleo versus Mediterranean, all the questions that Americans have that are very real. We have to accelerate the science and we'll get a huge return on investment, uh, for example, with the new National Institute of Nutrition. Number three, business innovation. Just like we, our economy uh, uh, has been spurred in the green energy sector by this administration and previous administrations, we need a, a national strategy and plan to spur the food sector. One in nine jobs in the United States are in the food sector. Right. And, and in many minority and rural communities, food sector businesses are the number one small business, the number one source of new, new jobs. We need a national plan to spur this sector, not just for economic growth, but for better nutrition, for health uh, equity, and for sustainability. And last, Dan mentioned this, we actually need somebody in charge. And so there, there is no person who's really coordinating this at the federal level. Secretary Vilsack right now has really just been an incredible leader and is probably the leader in the administration on these issues. But his home, his, his turf is the USDA, right? And so you need someone that can coordinate between USDA and the Department of Defense and Department of Education and um, the Department of Health and Human Services and all the other organizations like CDC, FDA, EPA, and on and on and on. And so we have very concrete proposals to actually increase coordination. So there's somebody in the White House who kind of uh, is, is, is you know, steering the ship. And I just add to Dari, we're like a team, uh, the uh, Laurel and Hardy of nutrition, I guess, except uh, Dari is much more, more intelligent in all this than I am. But the role of agriculture is extremely important. After all, everything we eat is produced uh, from the ground for the mm -hmm. most part, either raised it by an, an, an animal or a plant. And so we can't forget the role of the producers of food right. and everything that we're talking about. And our farm programs have, have largely over the years been devoted to focusing on the row crops, wheat, corn, cotton, rice, and soybeans. And then the re and many of those are fed to animals. And um, so um, in recent years, we have more and more incentives for farmers to grow specialty crops. That's brand new over the last 10 or 15 years. And so you're seeing more of that grown and therefore you're seeing a stronger political pressure in the field of agriculture to, to care about these additional crops. We're not going to get rid of, we're not going to change the world overnight. And, and besides, the science isn't complete in terms of what we ought to be eating. There's a lot of anecdotal stuff out there that we take as, as truth. But in fact, as Dari says, we need much more science and research. You know, I want to I want to pull the thread on what you said earlier to Dr. Musafarian about the uh, fifty years ago, uh, and we, t we you you touched on this, uh, Secretary uh, uh, President Nixon convened the first ever until now the only White House conference on food and nutrition and health. I, I guess what what's happened? I mean, why why is it taken so long? Um, it, it was obviously a historic event. Uh, Secretary said uh, that, you know, so many important programs came out of this initiative. Uh, where, where's the, why hasn't there been momentum and why should we think after 50 yeah. years there's enough energy behind uh, what might come out of this conference to really uh, see it through fruition? Well, I, I, so, you know, I, it's, it's a, I've been in doing this work for 25 years and every day waking up, you know, sometimes banging my head against the wall going, why are we not paying more attention to the top cause of poor health in the United States, the top cause of preventable health care spending in the United States, the top issue depleting our natural resources in the United States, one of the top issues facing the military and national security in the United States. Why is no one paying attention to this? And, and I, and I think it's because, you know, humans are evolved to worry about the saber-toothed tiger that's about to pounce on you, but not the smoking volcano that's going to erupt tomorrow and, and kill us all tomorrow. And so food has always been sort of the second issue, right? When was the last presidential debate where there were 30 questions on food, right? There should be. So somehow it hasn't entered the national consciousness. And I think, you know, what's changed is just, it's just the right confluence of, of time, the perfect kind of positive storm. COVID-19 led to incredible recognition around how frail and fragile our, our food supply chains are, and also of the incredible links between diet-related diseases like diabetes and obesity and hypertension and death from COVID. People are dying 
because of these diseases. Number two, the war, you know, the Russian war against Ukraine has led to a more recognition of how we have to really think about our food and, and where it's grown. The science has expanded enormously, and, and the science on obesity, diabetes, hypertension, people kind of see that and, and recognize it. And industry, and the consumer is starting to, to turn away from kind of unhealthy foods. It's happening, and consumers are, are, are shifting. And so there's all this disruption going on, whether it's hydroponic farms or plant-based you know, meat alternatives or wellness centers or other things. And the science in food as medicine has advanced. And so I think it's, it just happens to be right. a, a perfect storm where, yeah. where we can see some real action. And can I just add two things, two things? Number one, we have made amazing progress in the last 50 years. No American, well, with rare, I don't know, they, I'm sure there are, no American is in a famine situation anymore. I mean, food is, is ubiquitous and available. And the National School Lunch Program feeds 40 million kids a year. And, you know, so so now whether we've made the good enough progress in terms of the quality of food, we've made lots of progress on the quantity of food. Mm -hmm. Our SNAP program is the most developed feeding program in the world. No country has anything like what we have done in those programs. And in terms of school meals and and the elderly and the WIC program and dietary guidelines, I mean, America has really been engaged in these efforts. What's happened is, is that, as Ardari said, the health issues and the cost of health care and people's sicknesses have caused us to evolve into wanting to know more about what's in our food and just more than just what's on the plate and how much can we eat. So the quantity has turned into more of a quality issue mm -hmm. in, in recent years. Second of all, as Dari said, you know, we, this has not been the sexiest issue in the world. You rarely get, but, but policymakers get together, they'll talk about housing, energy, but you know they and, and they rarely talk about food policy, food security as as a high level issue. And that's because food is so available in this country. You know we don't have shortages for the most part at all. Years ago there was a movie called The Graduate. You may remember that Dustin Hoffman was given a famous advice by his uh, future father in law. He says the secret right. sauce is plastics. <laughs> okay. Well, that's no longer the secret sauce because plastics isn't necessarily good for our environment. But the secret sauce is more and more because of Dari and others' efforts is in food, food security, and the relationship to health. And that can change our national debate on the issue. Well, you know, the, the two of you are clearly the team to lead this with such uh, energy and optimism and knowledge. And I guess I, I have to ask you, Secretary Glickman, is it just possible that you have found the one issue that might truly enjoy bipartisan support as you look forward to moving these initiatives? Or are we still held back by beliefs about personal responsibility and needing to carve your own way. What, what do you think about that? This sounds like possibly from what you say, a real opportunity for bipartisanship. I think it is a real opportunity. And there is more bipartisanship in the food policy world than there is in most other worlds. But it's still not perfect. Let's be honest about it. You know, um, I mean, it's like the divisions on even minor issues today in politics. Uh, uh, kind of make me uh, sick to my stomach at times. And that, maybe that's not a very good parallel when we're talking about food. But uh, for the most part, it, there is a real opportunity here. Well, that's great. And we want to thank both of you. This has been a great conversation. We'll be watching and learning more as the White House holds this important discussion. We want to thank you and our audience for being here. You can learn more about conversations on healthcare and sign up for our email updates at chcradio.com. Thank you both. Great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And, and yeah. you know, uh, I'll tell you, you'd find a lot of resonance in the community health center world among the clinical teams and all the other teams around exactly what you're speaking about. I think the food as medicine message really has taken root in the primary care community, and we're glad of it. Yeah. And, and, and that effort to build advocacy across the country right down into targeted communities is so critical. Uh, and can be sort of the energy that lifts the uh, entire debate. Right. So thanks. Thanks for all right. the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Bye. And we also have some insights to share from co-chair Chef Jose Andres about hunger and health in America. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Jose Andres. Uh, some of you may know I'm a cook, and like many of you, uh, participating in the many ways that we believe that we can be fighting against many of the issues that seems uh, 
we face and what food seems is always in the middle. For way too long, it seems that food is always the problem. Food uh, creates uh, hunger when there's not enough of it. Food creates uh, obesity uh, when there's too much of it and the wrong food. Food sometimes is the cause of war. Sometimes war creates famine. Food in some cases can be part of climate change uh, in the way we cook uh, with charcoal. Um, food is in many ways a national security issue if we don't take food seriously. At the end of the day, it seems food is the problem. And I believe that food could be the solution. I know you believe that too. But um, we are in a very historic moment. The last food conference that happened at the White House with many amazing outcomes happened over 52 years ago in 1969 during President Nixon times. Now with President Biden, we have this amazing opportunity to think when we all come together as one, when we put food in the table and we live in longer tables, that we can actually for once, transform food the problem into food the solution. Food can be ending hunger. Food can be improving the nutrition. Food can be reducing obesity in America and around the world. Food can create jobs. Food can create peace. Food, at the end, can help us fight climate change. Food, if we treat it seriously, can be the solution to many of the problems we face. But we will only do this if we come together. And being together meaning that what is good for one group, fighting for something that is the right thing to do, has to be good for the other. We need to compromise. We need to understand that this is not people use trying to say, I am on nutrition, or people that say, I am in anti-hunger. No, it's all the same thing in more ways than one. This is what this White House conference wants to achieve, where President Biden wants to be in a bipartisan way in many ways, but also bringing everybody together with the right solutions. Only then we will improve in the next 50 years America through the power of food. One plate of food at a time can help us create a better tomorrow. Remember, good policy is good politics. And good policy must be here to serve every American, every group supporting food. If we all believe that together we can make it happen, I do believe out of this conference, great outcomes can happen that we will deliver what we all want to the American people where food stops being the problem and it starts being the solution. Please, let's all join efforts as one, we the people.